Good morning, Judson. Um, I don't know. Can every is the do we need to have the camera be adjusted? Every good. We're good. I'm trying to be obedient. I don't know why I felt like I needed to sit this morning. So. So the sermon, the, the scriptures that we heard read earlier from Jeremiah, has anyone ever heard of the prophet Jeremiah? Yes. Oh, quite a few. Okay. Well, I, just, I, I know that a lot of people haven't, um, aren't familiar with some of the stories in the Bible or some of the people in the Bible. So let me just do a little teaching real quick. Jeremiah was one of the major prophets of Israel who lived around 600 BC. He's known as the weeping prophet because he was walking through the streets trying to get his message across. He tried to get people to listen to him and repent. You may not be overly familiar with Jeremiah, but you probably have heard some of his more famous lines, like, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And uh, the new Revised Standard Version of the scriptures that were read earlier say, for surely I know the plans I have for you says the Lord, for plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Sounds familiar? Jeremiah came to prominence during the exile of the Jews to Babylon. The Old Testament is essentially the story of the Jewish people's relationship to God. They were trying to figure out what was happening. They were trying to make sense of the world. Many of the stories, and most certainly the prophets, will, will give us some insight into the relationship that they felt they had with God. They give us little details about who was ruling, who was fighting, what kinds of people were involved. The prophets give us names, and they, they give us places. They describe things that give us insight into how people were living and thinking a very long time ago. And just like we tell stories now uh, to our children, to each other by reading books and going to the movies, sitting in a theater in those red plush cushy seats. I always go to sleep in, in theater. It's too, it's too comfortable. I, I very rarely stay awake, I'm sorry. But for two hours in that theater, we we gain insight into the human condition. We suspend belief. We sort of say, hey, for the next two hours, my own situation is maybe mirrored on stage. We listen to these stories and we hear these words on stage or from a thousand, two thousand years ago, and we say, ah, I'm not the only one. Oh, I thought it was just me. So we have this record of Jeremiah's words, this prophet. He's talking to the people. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. The only reason I know the name Nebuchadnezzar is because of Matrix, <laughs> the movie. Remember the, the ship was called the Nebuchadnezzar? And I was like, that sounds like maybe something from the Bible. I'm just going to put this stuff over here real quick. But Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, he, he had defeated Judah, he had defeated the Jewish army, and he had decided, because he was so frustrated with having to fight the Jewish people, he's like, I'm going to take you back into exile. I'm going to take you to Babylon. So Jeremiah is talking to people who have not just been conquered, they have been uh, removed. Not just oppressed, but utterly defeated. The Babylon exile was so traumatic for these people that it broke time in half. There was a time before the exile and the time after the exile. That's actually how I studied it at Union. It was before the Babylonian exile and then after the Babylonian exile. Like that's how those courses were taught. We do that now. We break time into pieces 
all the time. There was life before 9-11. There was the time before you got married or before you had children or before you had a major illness or some other great accomplishment or some other great calamity. Well, this particular calamity was what Jeremiah felt called to speak to. He tells the people what he hears God saying to them. And the part of the story that's not included in what was read earlier is Jeremiah telling them, you know, take heart, keep doing what you're doing, keep living, get married, plant some gardens, Keep living. God's going to make everything all right. Imagine hearing this while you are living in captivity after being stolen away. Your best and your brightest, your smartest, your strongest have been taken first. Women and children have been taken, marched away. Your elders who know all the old stories who hold the history of your people have been marched off. I can't imagine living through something like that, but it sounds familiar to me when I think about the journey of Africans into this country. It was probably very similar, this idea that everything that connects you to the past has been stripped away. And so imagine in this situation, someone saying, weeping, walking through the streets, saying, hey, it's all going to be all right. Cheer up. <laughs> We've seen this recently. Hey, everything's going to be cool. That would probably make me very angry. But not just because it seems like an empty platitude, but because maybe on some level deep down, Maybe I believe I deserve this calamity. I can imagine that the people of Israel went through a laundry list of all the big and little things that they might have done wrong. The Bible is filled with stories of God being angry at the people of Israel because they weren't worshiping right, or they weren't eating right, or they were associating with the wrong people, or they weren't upholding their cultural practices. There was probably a long list of personal things that they were thinking about as well to blame themselves for what was happening. I don't know about you, but I am great at self-critique. No one is harder on me than me. I would venture to say that some of you might feel the same. I can take a missed bus or the train taking off right before I get there, and I can spin that into a character defect. Oh, if I had only gotten up earlier, I always do this to myself. I wish I could be better at, I can look in the mirror, and I can run through my memories and from top to toe and point out all the reasons why I'm not happier why I'm not richer, why I'm not further along in my career. If only this was different. If only I had done X, Y, or Z instead. When bad things happen, sometimes we think that there must have been something that we did wrong. There's actually a theory about this. It's called just world theology. It's the idea that the world must be a justice and righteous place, so you must have done something wrong if bad things are happening to you. It's why some people have a hard time believing what they see in video evidence on TV, because surely if that black person had listened to the police officer, they wouldn't have gotten shot. Just world theology tells us there must have been something that you did deserve this calamity. Obviously, I, we haven't worked hard enough, or maybe we'd be able to make ends meet. It can't be the criminalization of the poor, or the, or the healthcare system, or, or this country, or systemic racism, and homophobia. That, that can't be it. It must be something that I've done. 
So here we are. We can place ourselves in the audience that Jeremiah was talking to, listening to this letter from God that Jeremiah is dictating, this thumbs up. I can imagine how they looked around at their lives and their circumstances, and even though Jeremiah and God was calling them to life, all they saw around them was death. The death of their dreams, the death of their culture, the wishes for their children, their hopes. And despite the, the despair and the hopelessness that these people were feeling, Jeremiah dared risking their anger and their hopelessness. He risked their self-pity by delivering a very simple message. Live. Come back to life. He's saying, I know it's been hard. And you may feel like you're at the end of the line, but you are not. I know things did not work out the way you had planned. I know things look different than you imagined. I know that when you were a child, you had it all planned, blocked out. You had lists and lists, and you had pictures. You had a, a Pinterest board. I know what it might have looked like and what it looks like now. I know the world did not give you a fair shake. I know that you had enemies and abusive situations. I know that you trusted in the system and it ground you down into dust, but come back to life. I know that you think it's too late, that you are too old, that you are too young, that things have gone too far, that you can't undo it, that you can't reel it back or make amends, you are wrong. I know that you may look around at the world and instead of counting your blessings, maybe you recite your mistakes over and over again. I know what that's like. I know that if you could do it again, you would make different choices. But here you are sitting in your life now, and you are being called back to life. I am a witness that you can start again. I am a witness that you can continue to live a meaningful life, one filled with beauty and purpose and hope and joy. I am a witness that it's not too late. It's never too late to discover new things about the world, about yourself, about your life, about your calling, about your work, about your love, about your service. There can be new work, new purpose, new and old loves, renewed hopes, community work. Who's to say how many more chances you have? You have another chance. You have 10, you have 20, you have 100 other chances. Who can say that you cannot prosper in your time in Babylon? Who's to say that you can't turn captivity into prosperity, oppression into resilience, loneliness into self-reliance? God has declared, and I am a witness, that from the very beginning of time, Creation has been on your side, that you are not alone, and that there is no end to hope. There is no end to purpose. There is no end to justice. You can come back to life. Quiet that little voice that nags in the back of your head. Quiet it for just a few moments. That little voice that tells you all that is wrong with you and the world. Make space for the other voice that lives in your heart, the part of you that feels connected to the world, that sometimes is so quiet you can't hear. Make some room for that voice. That voice that says to work and to serve. Feed the wolf inside that wants to do good and starve the one that wants to lament and self-blame. Come back to life. You are called to do great things. We are all called to do great things. 
you're called to be loved and to be loving. There is work to do, Judson. There is self-love to grow. We don't have to dwell on dead things. Recognize the labor. Realize the toil. Reshape the struggle. We don't have time to dwell on dead things. Come back to life. Come back to family. Home is waiting for you. <laughs> 